You're listening to episode 24 of The Star Spot for Friday, February 22nd, 2013. I'm Justin Trottier, and I'll be your host at The Star Spot. The Star Spot is a space-themed podcast that focuses on all aspects of astronomy and space exploration. Episodes feature interviews with guests of wide-ranging backgrounds, scientists, engineers, educators, artists, politicians, and business people. Topics are similarly broad, from the latest space mission to how the universe began, from why humans explore to how we can make exploration economical. We'll also include a segment called Current in Space, bringing you reports on news and developments that may interest the space enthusiast. You can now find The Star Spot on Facebook at facebook.com slash the star spot and follow the show on Twitter at the star spot. I'm absolutely delighted to have as our featured guest at The Star Spot today, Dr. Sarah Seeger, a world authority on the study of atmospheres of extrasolar planets. Dr. Seeger will share with us how cutting-edge research is pushing the frontier, not just in discovering planets beyond our solar system, but in starting to actually characterize their attributes, like atmosphere and composition. She'll tell us about the startlingly diverse zoo of objects out in our galaxy, and most tantalizingly, how we are now on the cusp of being able to identify biosignatures of life as we home in on other Earths out there in space. But first, Here's what's current in space. One of the biggest world events dealing with space happened last Friday morning when a meteor shot across the sky in Russia, traveling over the Ural Mountains and leaving a trail of destruction in its wake before crashing into Chibarkal Lake. The shocking event brought the space program to the forefront and left many citizens asking questions about our current ability to detect and prevent such incidences from occurring. That's right. Most of the damage was the result of the shockwave that broke windows and devastated properties in Chelyabinsk city, as the meteor flew through the atmosphere, disintegrating and releasing an estimated 500 kilotons of energy, the power equivalent to 30 Hiroshima bombs. Over 1,000 people were injured, and just so you get a sense of the damage, the city's governor estimated that it will cost 1 billion rubles to repair. That's $33 million. The Russian Academy of Sciences says this was the largest meteor to hurtle through Earth's atmosphere since the one which hit Siberia in 1908, more than a century ago. Its weight was also underestimated. It was initially reported at 10 tons by the Russian Academy of Sciences, but turned out to be 1,000 times that. NASA reported it actually weighed about 10,000 tons after studying infrasound data from stations around the world. Edwin Bergen from the University of Michigan's Department of Astronomy explained why nobody saw this coming. He said the Russian meteorite was 15 meters in diameter, and it's difficult to detect things less than 100 meters. Unless you're looking for it. Or so K.T. Ramish, a professor of mechanical engineering at Johns Hopkins, clarifies. He says that while NASA's near-Earth object program currently tracks about 10,000 objects, there are many smaller ones just too tiny to track. He gave the analogy to finding a few pennies scattered over an acre of dirt, stating, quote, if you know where to look, you have no trouble seeing them. But looking over the whole field, the chance of finding a penny is pretty small. Yes, and only tiny fragments were left of the meteor, which are currently being studied at Ural's Federal University. Viktor Gurkovsky, who led an expedition on behalf of the university, said the 53 fragments were found in Chibarkal Lake. They are less than a centimeter in size and about 10% iron, and are the most common type of meteorite found on Earth. Just to define some terminology, a meteor only becomes a meteorite if it strikes Earth. This type of meteorite is thought to have its origin in the disk of gas and dust that formed around the sun at the very beginning of the universe. In the meantime, back on Earth, eBay is abuzz with more practical concerns. Some business-minded people have high hopes of investing in this piece of space history. Well, that should be interesting. You can bet counterfeits will be a plenty. On a previous episode of the Star Spot, we talked about NASA's latest Curiosity rover mission to Mars to look for hydrocarbons that could help to prove a potential past Martian life. Some of these organic material discoveries had been written off as earthly contaminations. Now, however, NASA's rover has sent some pictures back to Earth, showing that it did in fact dig up some samples from deep within the red planet. Curiosity ended up drilling six and a half centimeters into the Martian crust on February 8th, 
and by February 20th had provided scientists with the first images of its findings. Curiosity's collection of powdered rock extracted by its robotic drill will be transferred to an analytical instrument on the robot's body. There they will be examined to find out more about the substance and whether it shows evidence that water could have been present nearby. This story is history in the making. Curiosity is the first robot to collect samples from rocks drilled on Mars. An extremely rare occurrence, no rover has ever drilled into any surface off of planet Earth. No other robot that has landed on the red planet has been able to provide evidence of whether the area has ever been able to support microbial life. Curiosity can do all of this with a little help from its 10 scientific instruments and 17 cameras, as well as a hammering drill. Drilling deep into the Martian ground in turn takes scientists back three or four billion years in time, providing information about what the characteristics of Mars would have been like back then. After analyzing the sample, Curiosity should send results back to Earth in the nearby future on its findings. And that's what's current in space. On January 25th of this year, the Astronomy and Space Exploration Society, based out of the University of Toronto, hosted its 10th annual Expanding Canada's Frontier Symposium, a series that has become a fixture in the city for celebrating achievements in astronomy and space sciences and engineering. I'm particularly proud of these vital contributions to the scientific life of the city. The U of T Astronomy and Space Exploration Society was an organization that many of us involved with the Star Spot have been members and leaders of since the society was founded back in 2003, and we're all very glad to see it continue to thrive and to grow. But enough with the personal celebratory aside. This 10th event in the series was a real landmark focused on the search for life beyond Earth. The symposium speakers included Dr. Chris McKay, NASA's eminent astrobiologist who will join me at the Star Spot on an upcoming episode. And today's very special guest, Dr. Sarah Seeger. Dr. Seeger, who is herself from Toronto, Canada, is currently Professor of Astronomy at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology and a world authority on the study of atmospheres on extrasolar planets, the subject of her Harvard University PhD. She is the recipient of the Helen B. Warner Prize from the American Astronomical Society, Harvard's Bart J. Bach Prize in Astronomy, and she was named to Popular Science's fifth annual Brilliant Ten. Perhaps even more cool, NASA's Planet Quest has described Dr. Seeger as an astronomical Indiana Jones. We're here uh, chatting with uh, Professor Sarah Seeger at the Star Spot. Thank you so much for joining me. I want to ask you about extrasolar planets. Uh, that's, that's your specialty. But before we get into uh, atmospheres and other attributes of extrasolar planets, just give me the, the, the basics. How many extrasolar planets at this time do we have confirmed? And then how many do we have as candidates? We have hundreds and hundreds of exoplanets confirmed, nearly a thousand. And in addition to that, we know of about 2,000 more planet candidates. But honestly, that's really just the tip of the iceberg. We're finding that Astronomers are finding that every star in the Milky Way galaxy should have at least one planet. Yeah, I read the, uh, the statement that one of the exoplanet discoverers made that every time you look at the night sky, every time you look at a star, it likely has, or at least the average would be that it has one about one planet. It's yeah, incredible. that's right. So there are so many planets out there. So when we say 1,000 or 3,000, it sounds like a lot, but it's really tiny in the context of all the planets that we think are out there. Tell me a little bit about the diversity of the extrasolar planet zoo that we're discovering. Well, the diversity is insane. It's more diverse than anything we could have ever imagined. First, we started out with the so-called hot Jupiters, planets the size and mass of Jupiter, but instead of being at Jupiter's orbit so far from their star, they are close, close, like 10 times closer than Mercury is to our sun. Then one of the most remarkable types of planet we have, we just call them mini Neptunes, for lack of a better word. Uh -huh. And mini Neptunes are planets that are about two to three the size of Earth. Neptune is four times the size of Earth. Right. And you know what's so fascinating about those is that we have nothing like that in our own solar system, a planet of twice the size of Earth. Hmm. And what that means actually is we do not know how they formed. We don't know how they came to be. And furthermore, Kepler and others have shown, the Kepler Space Telescope and other techniques have shown that these so-called mini Neptunes are the most numerous type of planet in our galaxy. And this is different from super Earths. Yes, well, we actually do draw a line. We like to call super-Earths something that we think is rocky, like a giant rock ah. that has a thin atmosphere. 
whereas we think of a mini Neptune more like a planet with a massive gas envelope, such that there's no really real surface as we know it, or the surface, if it's there, it's buried under just a massive envelope of hydrogen and helium. So we do draw a line. There's kind of like a spectrum of, of sizes, I suppose, of planets. There isn't like only small and only exactly. large. Exactly. There's a spectrum. Within this yeah. diversity of size and uh, rocky versus gaseous, etc., are there any limitations on what we can detect with our current technological sophistication? There are huge limitations. There are huge kind of parts of the diagram that remain dark mm -hmm. and will so for a long time. Can you tell me a bit more about where those patches are? Well, we're pretty fixated on the patch where Earth would be. <laughs> <laughs> right, of course. And that's one patch that is dark. So each of the five or six different planet binding techniques have a strength. Some of them find planets close to the star, big planets close to the star. Some can find big young planets that are hot, that are extremely far from the star, like Pluto or further. And then microlensing tends to find planets somewhat in the middle. So I would say the regions we're missing are most things that are small or low mass are missing. Um, planets in an intermediate distance range from about, let's say, three to about you know 20 astronomical units are also missing. Your research delves not just into the discovery of extrasolar planets, but something extremely exciting, which is understanding their atmospheres. Tell me a little bit about our current technological abilities. What what can we tell about the atmosphere of an extrasolar planet with current technology? Well, right now our current technology, first of all, it's just amazing we can study atmospheres of planets so far away at all. Mm -hmm. But we're right now even more limited than planet discovery space. With atmospheres, we can really only study big planets. And so far, most of the planets, most of the few dozen or so exoplanets whose atmospheres have been measured have been hot Jupiters. Right. They're planets that are thousand degrees Kelvin or hotter. They're bright in the infrared. And furthermore, we mostly also study transiting exoplanets, planets that go in front of their star or behind their star as seen from the telescope. So with all those limitations in mind, we're able to do a few things. One is for some planets, we can identify major gases in the atmosphere, like water vapor or carbon monoxide or things like that, sodium. Uh, for others of them, we're able to just measure an approximate temperature of the atmosphere. That's confirming our theories that planets are heated from the outside by stars. For some of them, we're actually able to see hot spots on the planet. These hot Jupiters wow. we think are tidally locked. That is, they show the same face to their star at all times, just like the moon does to Earth. Mm -hmm. So they're heated tremendously, blasted on one side, and the other side remains dark in the dark all the time. And so a fundamental question has been, well, what happens on this planet? Is it really, really cold on the night side and really, really hot on the day side? Or just like, or does the heat equilibrate? And we find it kind of equilibrates, but not in all cases. Interesting. Now, j just like we're finding this diversity in terms of planet size, in terms of where they're located, in terms of rocky versus gaseous, with atmospheres, given that our data is uh, still, you know, uh, still coming in, you know, it's still pretty limited. But do we find that there is a huge diversity there too? Well, right now we don't see a huge diversity, and that's primarily because we're studying gas giants. They're right. gas, actually, it's kind of a misnomer, but for these giant planets, their gravity is well is so big, they can keep all the gases they are born with. And we think that the giant planets captured gas from the surrounding nebula, so they have like hydrogen, helium, and then carbon, oxygen, etc. We're not totally sure because our measurements aren't good enough to really say robustly what the ratios of those elements are. However, the next thing we're working on are the super-Earths and mini-Neptunes, and those ones are much smaller, lower mass, some have lower gravity, and we expect that those ones will all have a huge diversity among them because they're not big enough to withstand any kind of atmospheric evolution. Like on our own Earth, we think we had a completely different atmosphere when Earth was born, mm -hmm. and that the light gases like hydrogen just escaped to space. Right. And then stuff came out of the surface and then changed the atmosphere. Then life came up and made the atmosphere evolve even further. So we're expecting to see that diversity downstream. Now, you were one of the researchers that discovered the first atmosphere around an extrasolar planet. Can you tell me a little bit more about that particular discovery? Sure, yes. My role in that discovery was one of the things I still work on, and that's atmospheres of exoplanets. And we build large computer models with applied physics to try to understand what the atmosphere would be made of. In that particular case, sort of going back to the hot Jupiters versus super Earths and mini Neptunes, the question that I was asking was simply, what are the what would the what does the planet look like in terms of its spectral signature? And you know, if you take a ball of gas that's heated from the outside by a star and you can list what elements you think are in that gas, hydrogen, helium, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, et cetera, et cetera, then using laws of physics and chemistry, you can come up with what molecules will be present, what molecules and atoms. And one of the things that came out of that study was that sodium should be there. 
And sodium is really interesting. We actually liken it in analogy to, it's just you need a tiny amount to make a huge signature. And the colloquial analogy is like a skunk. You just need a tiny amount of skunk spray to make a huge difference. <laughs> and so this planet had sodium. And one of the things that I wrote about, I suggested that observers should go and look for sodium. And indeed that happened next with the Hubble Space Telescope. Hmm. So with the study of planetary atmospheres, you were talking earlier about you know that that uh, fuzziness in terms of our understanding of the extrasolar planet zoo and and one part of the fuzziness is in the the earth type area is that um is that also the case with atmospheres i mean is our goal to really hone down on and identify signatures of earth-like atmospheres yes absolutely i mean there are always more than one goal but i would say that our driving goal is to find planets with signs of life in the atmosphere and signs of so-called habitability we definitely want to do that, but to do that, we have to have a broader toolkit. So what we're looking for, actually, well, the first thing people like to do is think of what would Earth look like from far away. Now, our own Earth has one really outstanding feature in our atmosphere, and that's oxygen and ozone, because without life, plants and other photosynthetic life, like photosynthetic bacteria, we wouldn't have oxygen in the atmosphere. We would have like negligible amounts, yet we have 20% by volume of our atmosphere has oxygen. So if people, if there are, if there is some kind of intelligent life looking back at us, they'll see oxygen and they'll know that that's such a reactive gas, it really shouldn't be in our atmosphere. So essentially we're looking for gases that don't belong, gases that are many orders of magnitude out of equilibrium. And that's our main task right now is to sort of evaluate or assess the menu of options for what gases could be so unusual and how to find them. And then later on when we have the capabilities to look for them. When do you think we'll have those capabilities? When well, that's think... a great question. When you think of the atmosphere of a planet, it's really just a thin skin on top of the planet, like an onion skin on the top of an onion. So if you think about how hard it is to find planets at all, that atmosphere measurement is much harder, 100 or 1,000 times harder. Mm. So it's a huge challenge for us to, to really reach this level. But we have been studying Jupiters around sun-like stars with telescopes we have now, Hubble and Spitzer. And so we believe with the next generation space telescope, the James Webb Space Telescope, we can just scale everything down. And that with the same techniques we've developed now, we can study big Earths orbiting small stars. So if everything were to work in our favor, that we find a small star that's bright enough, that we have a planet with a puffy enough atmosphere, if all of our cards are lined up properly and we get lucky with an object that is in the right place and the star is bright enough, then with the James Webb Space Telescope, with enough time on the telescope, we have a chance of detecting signs of life in a planet atmosphere. Hmm. But you know, everything has to work out mm -hmm. in that case. So if we're really lucky, we'll have something then, and that would be probably within five to 10 years. I was reading some of the, um, the papers that, uh, that you've authored, and there was one that, that uh, caught my eye. It was one that you authored with a student of yours, and it talked about uh, super Earth atmospheres and distinguishing, I think it was hydrogen rich from hydrogen poor. Can you tell me why that's an important distinction and whether we expect to find super Earths with a specific set of possible atmospheric conditions? Yes, well, let me just say now our pendulum has swung. Before, we're like only Earth all the time in that we didn't believe that planets so different from Earth and with very different atmospheres could sustain life. Right. Now we're thinking, well, we really want to find life. We need to open our minds because what's easier to detect is not like Earth at all. Bigger planets than Earth are easier to detect. And with the James Webb Space Telescope, in what we call transmission, when the planet is in front of the star and the starlight shines through the atmosphere, atmospheres that are hydrogen dominated are actually easier to study. It's a lighter gas, it's puffier. Right. The so-called scale height is bigger. And the analogy is, you know how when people hike up Mount Everest, they run out of air? They say they run out of oxygen, but they're running out of air because pressure and density and the amount of air drops off exponentially. Well, that distance over which it drops off is related to the type of molecule that dominates the atmosphere. So for a planet dominated with hydrogen, it's a very, very light element compared to nitrogen in our atmosphere, and that so-called scale height is much bigger. So what it means essentially is the atmosphere is much puffier, much bigger. Oh, interesting. So we like hydrogen-rich atmospheres. We want them to be able to have life. Um, that would be a very different kind of atmosphere than Earth. So distinguishing between them is really important because our Earth has no hydrogen in the atmosphere to speak of. And so we want to know, um, do some of these super Earths have hydrogen because it's gonna make it easier for us to find life. Now that's my interest. Other people just wanna know because as we were talking about the spectrum or the continuity of different types of planets, hydrogen being in the atmosphere or not, it's a really big thing. Okay, so we know, we know oxygen is, um, is, a sign of, is a sign of life. Um, what are other biosignatures of life? That is a good question. You know, on Earth, 
would you believe there are thousands and thousands of chemicals produced by life? Just like when you walk in a forest and you smell all the different smells, each of those is potentially a biosignature. Right. But most gases produced by life are either produced in such small amounts that they, they're very specialized, they won't accumulate to levels that are detectable, or they're gases that are also produced by geophysics and geochemistry. Because mm -hmm. after all, life has the same molecules and chemicals to work with that the Earth does. So, for example, methane is a favored biosignature gas because it's produced by methanogens, bacteria that produce methane. But it also comes out of our vents on the mid-ocean floor. Mm -hmm. So we have a whole set of things, some of which are simpler molecules like methane and hydrogen sulfide and other things that also come out of Earth. And then we have a different set of things that are produced by life that may just be produced in small quantities. But we do have a whole list of things on Earth that people have started to work with. So in terms of those smaller molecules which come out of energy extraction from the environment, we do have methane, um, hydrogen sulfide. There are other gases that we like, like ammonia for hydrogen-rich atmospheres. In the other category, we have things like DMS, dimethyl sulfide. They're things that sound really obscure, but astronomers have gotten fixated on them. We have methyl chloride. And so there's a list of things produced by bacteria that we have. But at the end of the day, are we really smart enough? Are we really smarter than nature and really able to come up with this sort of great list of gases? You know, I don't think so. I think our message has to be we need to have the capability to look at all the, and look at as wide a range as good as possible in an atmosphere. It sounds greedy, I know. And then be able to understand what's there identify the molecules we expect to be there, and then be able to find things that are that don't belong, and then identify those molecules and work from there. If some of the signatures of life, maybe not oxygen, but some of these other ones are, are more obscure in the sense that they're, they're less prevalent in our atmosphere, if they're prevalent to about the same degree in, in the atmosphere of an extrasolar planet, would we be able to detect them? That's a good question. And well, we, we know which biosignature gases are on Earth that we could detect from afar. Mm -hmm. Because when we think of building a space telescope, we use Earth as our example. So that would be oxygen and ozone. It could be methane, like if early Earth had more methane, it could be N2O and things like that. Beyond that, we're trying to broaden our horizon and say, well, a gas may or may not be able to accumulate, but we'd like to know what its possibilities are. Right. However, there's one really cool thing that has happened in the last decade in exoplanet biosignature gas research, and that's the realization that the planets around smaller stars, if it's a quiet star in terms of its ultraviolet radiation, all biosignature gases have a higher chance to accumulate. Because did you know that photochemistry is the ultimate destroyer of all gases that come out of the surface? Mm -hmm. In fact, the sunlight breaks up water and oxygen and ozone, and this radical called OH forms hydroxyl radical. And in atmospheric science, it's known as the garbage eater of the atmosphere. <laughs> OH is up there and it just cleans everything up because it reacts with stuff and takes it away. Right. But if you're to have a planet like Earth with Earth's atmosphere around a star that emits much less ultraviolet radiation, that chain of events won't happen. You'll still get some OH but less. Less destruction of gases, etc., etc. So we find this to be true on the whole. And so that's why we're, there's like a many reasons I've given you two of why we like the big Earths around the small stars. Because if it's a quiet small star and has less ultraviolet, there is more of a chance for these more obscure gases to accumulate. You mentioned that a lot of these gases that are produced on Earth by life are also produced by, by non-living processes and that that's a challenge for us studying extrasolar planet atmospheres. But if we look at the ratios of, of different, um, you know, different uh, biosignatures here on Earth, it, are those ratios something that would be applicable in the search for life on extrasolar planets? Would we expect to see similar ratios of our kinds of biosignatures, our kinds of chemical signatures of life on Earth on other planets? I will say first that we don't know. And second, when we do come to beginning spectra of planets that would be like Earth or bigger versions of it, unfortunately, we're not going to have a beautiful spectrum that contains all the information. Right. Kind of based on our experience already, our kind of test case of the hot Jupiters around the sun-like stars, we're going to have a smattering of things, maybe something here, something there in terms of the wavelength and features. So that may be downstream that if we do find, oh, look, here are a whole bunch of planets that have signs of life, we'll actually need to go and do Planet Finder, Planet Search 2.0 and do a better job and then try to answer those questions. Are there any signatures that would prohibit life, that would more or less categorically rule out the possibility of life being on a planet? It's not clear if there's any signs like that. People have thought of it, but not too deeply. 
Tell me more about the the equipment and the technology that we're using to make these kinds of analyses. I know that obviously telescopes are involved, but then also computation, right? Uh, computer analysis and simulations are also play a, play a part. Can you explain how that process works? Well, when we take data with the telescope, typically there's a lot. It's like taking a picture, imagine taking a picture with your camera, but now you have to go in Photoshop. Mm -hmm. And I don't mean Photoshop to introduce new <laughs> things, but Photoshop to take away bad things like red eye flash and things like that. Right. So essentially we get data, but there's a lot of problems with the data because of the instrument or systematics or backgrounds or other things like that. So there's actually quite a complicated process in modeling the data and removing so-called systematics. But once that's done and you have what you consider a clean data set, a clean image or clean data set, then you have to model the data to understand what's in it. So for example, if you're looking at a transit light curve, when the star is constant with time and then drops in brightness when the planet goes in front of the star, you now want to know the parameters of that system based on the depth of the transit or the duration. What does it tell you about the planet size and the planet orbit? So then you use physical models, models of a physical system, and fit the data and try to come up with something. Recently, people have, astronomers have gone crazy with statistics, trying to use a, a kind of statistics called Bayesian statistics to um, say if you know something in advance, can you rule out other things? And so that ends up happening as well. If we were to find, let's say, oxygen in the atmosphere, atmosphere of an extrasolar planet, um, that we don't find any of the biosignatures, I guess that's the wrong word, that um, we come to see would likely prohibit life if, if such exist. Um, how, would, would, would the headlines declare life's been discovered? Would, would merely finding oxygen or another you know, uh, clear case on Earth of a biosignature, would, would that be enough for us to know that life is there? Or with the universe being so mysterious, could we fathom other possibilities for how even oxygen could get onto an extrasolar planet? Great question. And this is the kind of thing that we worry a lot about. The question is, after a lifetime of work of many people, when we find finally find oxygen or gas that doesn't belong, are we going to be able to come to you and say unequivocally, yes, we have found signs of life? Or will we say, well, in this case, it's 99%. Right. 99% exactly. is not that high. Mm -hmm. For Like, would you go on an airplane if you had 99% <laughs> chance a one out of 100 would, would crash? Or would we say, you know, in this case, it's only 50-50? And so actually, what I really see happening is that at the end of the day, we're going to come to you and go, you know what? Life is everywhere. Because we see 100 planets, half of them have a, quite a sure sign of life. The other half have a kind of sign of life. But it's really unlikely to me that we'll be so unequivocally sure that we will be able to just, you know, bet our life on it. Now, that said, we could still be 99% sure. And indeed, even with oxygen, astronomers are busy evaluating what are the cases where you could have oxygen that's not produced by life. And typically, we could rule in or rule out other situations, just like what you said before, by the rest of the spectrum. So for example, at some point, we think Venus had oceans and that the oceans boiled off. And when they boiled off, water vapor would have filled the atmosphere and water vapor got split up by sunlight. With the hydrogen, the light gas escaping to space, and oxygen would have built up for a while. So in that case, with a lot of oxygen, you'd also have a huge amount of water vapor in that runaway greenhouse effect. So we can kind of think of different scenarios, but we require a great spectrum that fills in all the areas. So we think we can rule them out, but again, it goes back to, are we, is nature smarter than we are, or are we? So we'll see. So do you guys have SETI on standby? So if we are, you know, 99% sure that a planet has life, you know, turn the telescope, see what kind of life, if it's communicating life? Well, what's interesting is SETI has kind of always been its, its, own, its own world. Yeah. But SETI is still working in parallel, and they're actually already doing this kind of thing. Mm -hmm. So in the Kepler field of stars, Kepler has many stars with Earth-sized planets, not all in the habitable zone or anything like that. But yes, yeah, SETI is definitely going to be following up. I think the more interesting question is if we see one of those, should we be sending a signal to it? Should we be trying to communicate ourselves rather than just listen? Now, you also study the interior of planets, which we haven't really gotten to. But I guess the obviously the interior and the atmosphere, they they affect each other, right? right. In pretty intimate ways. How exactly does that work? Well, I would say the first thing that the first way interiors are relevant is we want to know if we're dealing with a rocky world or a world that's made mostly of hydrogen and helium. Because if the planet is a big ball of hydrogen and helium, it will have no surface as we know it. Or a planet buried under a massive atmosphere, the surface will have temperatures that are too high for complex molecules for life. So first we just want to know about that. The other question is how do we relate the interior to the atmosphere? That is ongoing research. And we're honestly not even sure if there will be any real observables that connect the atmosphere and interior. Are there uh, expectations that the interiors of the planets, whether they be a rocky planet like the, 
the, the four rocky planets in our solar system or a, ga a gas giant like the gas giants in our solar system, that the interiors will, will be similar to the interiors of, of the rocky planets or gaseous planets we're familiar with? Well, you know, there's two ways to do science. One is to sort of build upon things you know, and another one is to say I'm open to what the universe tells me. And we're kind of stuck both ways here because what we have in our solar system could be like others or there's other possibilities, but the observations are so limiting that we can't really just use that open book kind of method. There are some ideas, I mean, some people think that some planets may be carbon rich, that if they form in a very unique environment where carbon is more abundant than oxygen, that instead of getting like rocky material made out of silicon oxides, you get actually silicon carbides and that the interiors could be somewhat different. But on the whole, if you think about the main types of planetary of material that planets can form from, there's not a whole lot of options. And then you have gravity and pressure. And so there's not an infinite variety, but there are certain key things. And I'll just mention one of interest. And we're really interested in new things. And we like the concept of water worlds, planets that we imagine are made of 50% by more of water. And these would be like scaled up versions of Jupiter's icy moons. Just in our last couple of minutes, because I know you're about to, to head to the, uh, to the airport, um, because I'm also interested, the show's also interested in sort of popular understandings of science and astronomy. I think I caught you on some episodes of Ancient Aliens. Was that you? Right, that was yeah. definitely me. Tell me um, sort of what led to, to that invitation to have, to have you on the show. Well, um, I'll say one thing that I am fascinated with people's fascination with aliens. And you would not believe how many people here on this earth believe that aliens have visited Earth. Now, when the show started, it was to be just a one episode. Half of the people were opposed. Half of the people would be for the what theory. What was this to be one episode, not a whole Originally, series? Originally, it was okay. just one episode. They just filmed for one episode, interviewing half of the people, also interviewing half people who were opposed to the theory that ancient aliens had visited Earth and helped us get started with pyramids and other big structures. And the other half of the people were to believe in it. And they really did film half, because I saw some of the other people being filmed, mm. and I talked at length with the people making the show. So when the one episode came out, guess what? 98% people for, 2% against. And in the comments against was really interesting because wow. they had taken the against comments um, and clipped them so it looked like even the, some of the against people were for. Now what else was really interesting to me from a sociological viewpoint was the people who are for were so exuberant and charming and outgoing and I think the people against were kind of more wooden. And I think that was partly how the choice was made. Then the show took off like the producers had no idea it would have ever happened. And then uh -huh. it grew into a series where now it's happened like every year for like four years. And it's been watched by probably hun at least tens of millions of people, probably more all around the world. And I know this because people write to me and I'm barely on the show at all. And I still get a ton of people writing to me from this. So mm -hmm. I started going on the show. And after a while, I realized what was happening that my statements were getting chopped to look like I believed, usually. Sometimes I get to be the voice of reason. And so after a while, I kind of decided I probably can't be on the show anymore. Mm -hmm. But before I made that decision, I tried one more time. Um, I'll give you an example that they I'd say, well, um, astronomers know about Lagrange points that are kind of like balance points where you could a spacecraft could stay and it wouldn't necessarily, they're kind of unstable, but big picture, it wouldn't take a lot of effort to stay there. Mm -hmm. But we know they're done there. And that second part, but we know they're done there, would be cut off. And they'd go, oh, astronomers believe that there are spacecraft. And then there I would wow. be saying that we have a theory. We understand the gravity. <laughs> so then I would say everything in one breath. Blah, 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 blah. And they still would chop it up. So I was like, I just can't be on this. But I wish that they would include more people who didn't believe because it's a theory that we're all fascinated with, all the crazy things that we see around us that are unexplained. And if they could have people saying, well, it's okay that things are unexplained. We'll try to explain them later. They may live in the category of not explainable. I wish they could have more voice of reason in addition to just showing people all these cool things out there. So when they invited you on, when the initial premise of the show was described, did they sell it as a fair and balanced, whatever they might mean by that, approach to this topic? They did sell it that way, and I believe the original writers intended that. I, I have no reason to believe that they were misleading. I mean, they were really genuine. They were genuinely interested. And just from all the questions that I was asked, because, you know, they'll interview people for a few hours, and then you'll end up on for a few minutes there, a few minutes there. Of course, yeah. It was really quite, my first interview was just really an amazing experience, because the original interviewer and people making the show uh, really had a great intention. And we talked about a lot of things, like about how the ancient people studied the stars. They were always out there, always around. And here we don't really see them anymore if we live in a city or we're busy with our computer. And they knew and they watched and they passed on from generation to generation um, 
what the stars were doing, and they were able to think logically and make predictions based on that long period of general knowledge. And so we kind of went through all those things and some alternate explanations. And they got really excited about stuff. Like I have a child who was born on the summer solstice, two hours before the solstice. Mm. And so they're like, well, would he have been a really special person in that society? I mean, I didn't know the answer to that, but they kind of really were able to tie things out there with what could have really happened, you know? And we could talk about how, well, part of the show is based on the fact that our ancient ancestors were stupid, but actually they weren't. They were really smart, and so we could sort of go through things. So I know they had different intentions originally. Getting people interested and excited about astronomy and ancient civilizations is, of course, a very worthy goal, but um, given that you've done, you know, presentations in the public interest of science and all of that, how do you think we can best sort of harness people's inherent interest to an extent in questions of astronomy or, or ancient aliens and all of that to better inform the public about the truth behind some of these claims or just science in general. It's really tough because those of us who are on the side of logic and reason, we're just busy working. But I think there's a new thing that people like you and your listeners can really help with, and that's the whole new social media and how people want to be engaged and can be engaged. And I think it's going to be that avenue of true engagement that's really going to help the right word get out there and get people more and build upon people's enthusiasm and knowledge in science. Thank you for joining me here at the Star Spot, Sarah Seeger, to help my listeners, you know, build their awareness of some of the fascinating work that you're involved with. I appreciate it. My pleasure. Thank you for joining us at the Star Spot, mind and universe continually expanding. The Star Spot with Justin Trottier is an astronomy and space themed podcast based out of Toronto, Canada. Please send comments or questions to starspotpodcast at gmail.com. The Star Spot is produced by Ying Zhang Li. Marketing and promotions by Natalie Morcos. Guest news and voiceover by Amanda Gadke. Research by Alexander Gurevich. Web design by Blair Renault. Graphics by Carmina Svillens. And I'm your host, Justin Trottier. Thank you for listening. <laughs>